Hi, and welcome to this presentation in which we look at the stress in a rotating wheel sector using ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. We use just one sector of a wheel with a rotational velocity of 3600 RPM. We'll use frictionless boundary conditions to get symmetry effects. Free axial movement by the wheel will be constrained. In this demonstration, you'll learn how to use Workbench Mechanical for finite element analysis in ANSYS in order to look at a model of a rotating wheel with centrifugal forces caused by rotation. We'll have a quick look at a meshing method, we'll put on symmetry boundary conditions, and we'll examine results. Here we are on the Workbench project page. We're going to look at the rotating wheel sector for that, we'll go to the Toolbox, down to Static Structural, and drag and drop it into the Project Schematic. When it's there, we click the Geometry cell. We right-click, and for this particular example of geometry, we're going to import it. Having looked at it recently, we can pick it right here. Simple Sector. .stp, that's a step file. See the green check mark That tells us that we're ready to go. Go to the Model cell right-click and edit, and you can see the M we're going to edit in Workbench Mechanical. We wait for it to come up. Once Workbench Mechanical is ready, you can see this reminder on Usage Tips, which is currently showing itself. It's a useful review of where things are in the interface. If we look at what's come in, you can see the geometry for the wheel sector. It's one-eighth of a complete wheel, and we'll take advantage of symmetry in order to look at this thing with centrifugal force. Here's the geometry. The one part, notice it's been given the default structural steel model, a simple steel model for self-teaching. A reminder of the materials in the model. If it was a complex model, that could be useful. We have one default coordinate system, a global coordinate system. Note that it happens to be right on the axis of this wheel if we had the complete wheel present. We have meshing controls. We're going to take a simple approach to meshing. First, I'm going to go down and look at some of the settings. There's a resolution cell in here. So under the details of mesh settings, for sizing, I'm going to take that resolution number and I'm going to crank it up to 6 in order to get a finer mesh than the absolute default. Note that it has filled in this complex piece of geometry with tetrahedral elements. There will be 10 nodes per element. What I'm going to choose to do, though, is something a little bit more complex. I'm going to go to Insert. I'm going to insert a meshing method. And the one I'm going to assign to this piece of geometry is multi-zone meshing. Software intelligence will be used to achieve a hex mesh by taking the one piece of geometry and choosing to sweep hex meshes through various parts of this one piece of geometry. I'm going to provide some guidance to the multi-zone mesher. I'm going to use manual settings of faces from which to begin some of the sweeps. I'm going to click here and hold the control key. Click here, click here, click here, and click here, and hit apply. This ought to help the software decide how to do the sweeping to try to get a hex mesh. Let's see what happens. Here we see a nice, clean, successful hex mesh. It's fine enough for the simple job we're doing here, though if we wanted good vibration characteristics, we might want a bit finer mesh in order to have two elements running through the thickness this way. Let's go down now and look at loads on this model. I'm going to use a simplified approach to symmetry by putting frictionless support on these flat faces. I'm going to click here, 
and hold the control key and click here and these two faces will be given that frictionless support. That will provide constraint perpendicular to these faces implying symmetry in a model that has no loads other than in a purely radial direction. Now I need a rotational velocity. Right click and insert rotational velocity. This will apply to all bodies as you see right here. I'm going to choose 3600 revolutions per minute and I need to define an axis. That will be implied if I click on a face right there. That implies the axis, which is the axis of the whole wheel. I went onto this cylindrical face and you can see here's my rotational direction. That's all I need in order to run an analysis. However, I do need one more constraint to prevent free motion of this body in that z-axis direction. So let's go find a vertex. We'll click on one right there, right click and insert a directional displacement constraint and I don't want it moving freely in that Z direction. I put in a zero and I hit the enter key and now we have enough constraint to stop this thing from being able to run away freely in space. Before solving I'm going to plan ahead and insert a total deformation plot as well as a von Mises equivalent stress plot. Let's solve the model. It's a purely linear model, so only one iteration will be needed in order to get the solve. You can see some data being written out while the solve takes place, and the analysis has finished. Note that it tells us what license was employed, and if you scroll down a bit, you can see which release has been used, and other information about the model. If I scroll all down, you can see the one load step that was run and information on it. You can learn about the mass of your model, its inertias. You can learn a bit about the kinds of elements in the model. Let's have a look at a result. Here's a total deformation plot. Notice that the deformation has been exaggerated. If I'm in the results tab, and this is a context-dependent tab up here. Look, as I move around, it's a geometry-related tab. Here's a meshing-related tab, an environment-related tab, always the one just to the right of the Home tab. Here we are in the Solution tab, and I can change the scaling of the displacement. The true scale, 1 to 1, isn't big enough to be visible to the eye. That's turned on when we have a large displacement analysis, but in a small displacement analysis the default is to auto scale by an amount that makes the displacement visible to the eye, roughly exaggerating displacements so that the largest is around 10% of the scale of the geometry in your model. If I animate this, you can see how the centrifugal force makes this thing deform. Now it's helpful to look down the z-axis and you can see these faces remain flat because of the symmetry in this model. It's a rotating wheel, a complete 360 degree wheel, modeled by only one sector. Let's have a look at the stresses that result. And the stresses are perhaps about what you'd expect. Note the stress concentration in these corners. The mesh here isn't really fine enough to give a high quality stress result in this zone and we would need to mesh with smaller elements in this area if we wanted higher accuracy for these local stresses, which might be of interest if fatigue was a bit of an issue. I hope that this quick review of the behavior of a model will give you some insight on the basics of modeling including applying symmetries with a frictionless support, which is OK on flat faces, and looking at a meshing approach, and considering displacement and stress. This concludes the demonstration of setting up a rotating wheel model.
Thanks for joining me.